So really the heartland, the very start of European culture as we know it today, kind of started in Greece. And so that's where we're going to start our history uh, part of this unit. And so um, Greece is down towards the southern part of Europe. It's on the Mediterranean Sea. And as you can see, it's a peninsula and then also a group of islands down here in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and so um, as you're looking here, this is obviously that peninsula part. And then here's a big island. There's a bunch of different islands that are part of um, Greece. And so this area is kind of where all of it started. And so first we need to talk about kind of the geography of the area. Um, in Greece, there's a bunch of mountains. There's a lot of mountains, as you can see, running all the way through the kind of that brown color right here. There's mountains. There's mountains all throughout here. And then in between those mountains are kind of nice little valleys. But that's the only farmland in all of Greece. So there's just not very much farmland. Just those small valleys that are really close to the ocean that are near the coast. And so... What does Greece have? How do they possibly become such an important part of the history of Europe if they don't have any farmland? I mean, every single place has had to have farmland to be important that we've talked about so far. Uh, what they did have is they had lots of fish. They depended on the sea for food as they went out and, and fished. That was their kind of main source of protein, main source of meat. And then another thing that there was a lot of in the area was marble and limestone. Marble and limestone are... Um, you know, stones that can be used for building that really hold up very well. And so they can, they can last for a very long time. And they use these stones to make a lot of their buildings. And so this is a reason why we can see so much of their history and understand so much of the history of Greece is because they, you know, they use these building materials that allow it to still be standing today. Um, the way that it kind of set up it initially in Greece was there were kind of independent settlements. So they were their own little countries in each of these valleys. So it might be a city, but it's governed as if it's a country. Every city is, is separate. They have their own leaders. They have their own setup. Um, and of course, these are by the coast, by the ocean. And so many, many of their own little countries in these small spaces. And so in 3000 BC, we'll kind of uh, talk about our first big civilization. So the first big civilization was the Minoans. The Minoans lived on the islands mostly, and they lived out, uh, a lot of them, on this large island of Crete. Okay, and so that, that was kind of the main area where the Minoans lived, and they were excellent sailors. Um, very, very good sailors, and they started to develop a lot of things that a society needs to have for us to recognize it in history. They started to develop their own system of writing. They started to develop trade as they were going to the mainland of Greece and trading things and they were going to Egypt and trading things and they were able to make a lot of money and have a lot of influence. At the, about the same time, the Mycenaeans were living on the mainland, and so they weren't developing at quite the same rate as the Minoans, and they weren't becoming quite as powerful, but they had a very powerful military. And so what they did is in 1400 BC, again, this is a long time later, it's 1600 years later after this all started, they came out and took over uh, the Minoans with their superior military. And what they did is they adopted their systems. And so it was a group of new people doing the same things that the Minoans had created. Um, however, we uh, what we know is that the Mycenaean civilization collapsed, and it collapsed in 1200 BC, about 200 years after they took over the Minoans. And we really based on what we have, artifacts and things like that, we don't know exactly why uh, that civilization collapsed. So I talked about those small civilizations. Eventually, they developed into uh, city-states. And a city-state um, is a kind of a way of saying that each of these things is a city. It's about the size of a city. But the state part means it's, it acts as its own country. It's its own thing. They're not all connected at all. Okay, And so there's these own, there's, there's tiny little countries that are basically just these fortified towns with walls on the outside where they can protect themselves. Okay, And so 
Essentially what a city-state was, was a city that controls all of the surrounding villages and farmlands. So this one fortified city is in charge of all these different little people that are living out on the farms and things like that. Now again, they're independent governments, they're all on their own, and of course they were separate countries, so they fought with each other. They fought with other city-states, Athens and Sparta are probably ones you've heard of, you know, were constantly fighting with each other. And most of them were aristocracies. And an aristocracy is kind of interesting. It's it's the actual definition of an aristocracy is that it is run by the best people. However, the best people, what does that really mean? What it means is the people who have been rich and have been in power for many, many years. It's passed down through the family that you get to be an aristocrat. Now, eventually... Uh, this became a problem, as it almost always does, because what happened is some people got rich, but they didn't have the family behind them. They didn't have the many, many years of rich family behind them, and so they had no power, even though they had just as much money as these fancy aristocrats. And so what these merchants did, this middle class that started to get more and more rich, they rebelled, and they fought against uh, the aristocracies the what that what was set up in these city-states and as they rebelled um, many many tyrants and oligarchies so that means like a tyrant is like a dictator a nasty dictator and then oligarchies a small group of people would take over real quick so that they could quickly restore order and get people to listen to them so that they could get control back Now, the most important link to the outside world was trade. It was so important. And so um, there was a lot of trade happening in Greece and from Greece that was allowing them to be very influential throughout the world. Um, they traded in Asia, in Egypt, in Mesopotamia. They traded in the Middle East, which allowed them to have connections to both Africa and Asia. And what they traded, the things that they had that they could trade away were olive oil gold, silver, and iron, and they can make a whole lot of money by getting or you know trading off these things that they had a lot of. Okay. And so the thing about trade is when you're out there trading, you're not just talking about what's the price, what is this, whatever. Okay, you're you're living in another culture for a while and so you're talking about your culture and their culture. And so um, the culture of Greece started to spread out and people started to become exposed to it and think, oh, that's kind of interesting and, and tell their friends that it would just spread out and spread out and spread out. And so Crete Greece became a cultural hearth, and a cultural hearth, what a hearth is, is when you have a fireplace in the middle of your house, many, many old stool, or old style houses had a fireplace right in the middle, that's the hearth, that's where all of the warm warmth comes from, so it's usually bottom floor, middle of the house, just kind of the center of it all, and then all the warmth comes out and goes everywhere else. Well, a cultural hearth is saying that this is kind of the center of culture in the entire world, and um, the new ideas and culture is spreading out to all the other areas. So they started to spread out um, their ideas as well as starting to colonize, starting to take over areas. And they did this in areas of Italy, in France, in Spain, in Libya, in Egypt, in Turkey. I mean, this uh, sphere of influence from Greece was really, really large. One of the most influential city-states was Athens. And in Athens, uh, some of the reformers with all this oligarchy and tyrants and stuff like that happening, they wanted to stop the abuse of powers from these people. And they wanted to turn it from an oligarchy, a small group of people being in charge of the whole thing, um, into a democracy. And so um, some of these people or some of these reformers are listed below. The first one is Solon. And Solon, he uh, did a couple of things. He thought it was important as a leader to end the slavery of debtors. So if somebody owed somebody else money, they didn't have to become their slaves. And so um, that was a big step in starting to eliminate the idea of slavery a little bit. Um, and he also gave every citizen of Athens the right to vote for a leader. Now, this is a really big deal because he's allowing every single person, it doesn't matter if you are, 
you know, rich or poor or whatever, you get to vote for the leaders. Um, the one issue is it didn't include a lot of people because the only people who could be citizens of Athens were adults and men, so adult men who had parents that were also Athenian that had been around. Women were not allowed to participate, and then also foreigners were not allowed to participate, even if they moved there and made their business there or whatever. And so the second one we're going to talk about is Pericles. And Pericles was around mostly in the mid-400s B.C., okay? And in the mid-400s B.C., um, what he did is added a couple other things that helped this out. And he started to pay politicians. So anybody who came in and was a professional politician could get paid for it. And so that allowed the poor people to do it. Because before, the only way you could be a politician is if you were so rich you didn't have to work. You didn't have to spend your time working. Um, and under Pericles, Athens became the world's very first, the very first one that we have a record of, uh, direct democracy. And a direct democracy is where every single person has a say in the government and so in day-to-day -day governments uh, issues like uh, making laws or anything like that the citizens were allowed to participate okay and so Athens very quickly became this cultural center of Greece and from there the ideas um, started to kind of spread out okay now we're going to talk about day-to-day -day life in Greece and what life in Greece was like. Uh, first off, in Greece there was there was a religion, okay, and the religion included um, it was a little bit different than the religions that we know that I know as a Christian and that um, you guys know, um, and so the religion was it had a bunch of gods multiple gods it was polytheistic okay and then these gods had kind of supernatural powers but they were active in the lives of of humans right now and so these gods would rule over these different areas of life and different nat or areas of the natural world whether zeus was in charge of you know storms and and thunder and lightning and things like that or um, Hades was involved with hell in the underworld or, you know, each one, Poseidon was in charge of the sea, all of these different things. And so each god would be in charge of a different thing. And they all kind of lived up in Mount Olympus and they were led by Zeus. Okay. And instead of having like one, uh, instead of having one holy book like the Quran or like the Bible um, or anything like that they had mythology which mythology were these stories that were shared through generation after generation after generation and then they would build these amazing temples with these beautiful statues of marble that still are standing some of them today um, of the gods that were important to them the other thing that was a big part of life in Greece was philosophy and philosophy literally means love of wisdom and so what they would do is they would apply logic and reason to kind of try and study the world and so instead of using this uh, religion they were trying to use logic and reason and figure things out and so um, it kind of all started with Socrates and then um, Socrates uh, was the teacher of Plato and taught him about some of these things and then Plato was the teacher of Aristotle and they were some of the big thinkers that thought and spoke and wrote about government and ethics and religion and all that kind of stuff and and just as an example of something they said they said that poetry was more important in a better study of, of people than history was because poetry was about the universal thoughts of people whereas history was about particular events and so they're thinking like how do people react and act is more important than something that has happened in the past or something very specific. Um, some of the other scientists and, and philosophers that came from this time were Aristarchus, and Aristarchus um, had a theory way, way back using math and observations way before, you know, the people that we credit for it. And he said, I think the earth goes around the sun. I don't think the sun goes around the earth like most people think. I think the earth goes around the sun. And then we also had Herodotus 
And I guess this is a typo. It's my first typo here. Okay. Um, the N is not there. It's Herodotus. Okay. And Herodotus is the father of history. He's the, he was the first person to actually write down and note the events and then try and analyze them and what was important about them. All right, now again, day-to-day -day life in Greece. What kind of things did they do for fun? Um, Greece had a rich literacy, literary, I'm sorry, tradition. Um, they had many plays and poetry. Those were the things that people really enjoyed and liked about it. Um, they also had a, a very rich tradition of architecture. And some of their architecture um, is really apparent, and you can see it in the construction of some of their temples. And one of the most impressive temples that's still standing today is the Parthenon, which we have a picture of right here. I think you have a picture of it in your notes, so make sure you are labeling that as the Parthenon. And the Parthenon is, er, and all the temples were basically these long chambers, this long kind of hallway within the middle was a big statue of the god that was um, the kind of most important god for each city-state. They kind of all had their main god. And in Athens, it was Athena. And so in the Parthenon, which was the temple in Athens, Athena was the uh, statue that's that was found in the middle. Okay, uh, very important statue. But you can see some of the uh, Greek architecture here. You can see the uh, pillars were a big uh, use of it. Also, this kind of triangular top to it is another um, big thing that was used in Greek architecture. They also had festivals, festivals to honor their gods, and one of the festivals that we still are using today is the Olympic Games. They were found, or mostly done in Olympia at that time, and every four years the best athletes from all the city-states would get together to honor Zeus and um, they would compete in things like um, running, wrestling, jumping, all these athletic endeavors. And um, one of the weird things about the original Olympics is to kind of avoid um, any any like drag or anything like that um, to keep themselves as aerodynamic as possible and everything, they often competed without clothing at all. And so um, the first Olympic Games, the first few were done completely naked, which is kind of a weird thing. At home, the um, life in Greece was pretty simple life. Most people lived in homes made out of uh, mud bricks, and most people ate meals that include like bread, cheese, olives, and fish. So really you didn't have much meat because you didn't have much place to raise uh, meat animals like cows and pigs and things like that. Um, however, in the public, it would be uh, more like this type of space. This space on the very top picture is called an agora. And an agora is basically a town hall or town square, and it's a public space that has government buildings, religious buildings, and market buildings. And so you could go there to pray, um, to do anything involved with the government, or to you know, sell or buy things, okay, and so it's kind of like the downtown area or the industrial area. Um, most of the people that were in the Agora at any time were freemen, and freemen was the um, definition of kind of rich men that own land, and so not slaves, but also people that were, you know, not busy working all the time, and so they need or didn't need to... Um, you know, they had some time to actually come in and go to stores and pray and do all these things. Okay, now slavery. Slavery in uh, Greece was happening. And most of these slaves, again, were white people. There just were not that many black people in um, Greece at the time. And so anybody who was captured during a fight, during a war, during anything like that, other Greeks, uh, they were forced mostly, most of the time, into slavery. Now, eventually they could buy their freedom, but these slaves, these people did most of the really hard work, the hard labor that was happening in ancient Greece at the time. Again, we talked about conflict from or between those city-states, and Athens and Sparta had kind of the biggest conflict because they were the two biggest uh, city-states. But Athens had the best navy. They were the best on the sea, and Sparta had the best army. They had an unbelievable army um, that, that could 
take out anybody on land, essentially. Sparta was different. It was different than Athens. It was run differently. Everything was different. Um, what they did to have such a good army is they started to train their soldiers at, or train kids to become soldiers. So if they thought you would become a soldier, they thought you'd become a Spartan soldier, then you started to train as that as a kid. And you would put your military career and military victories and things like that above your family. Your family was less important than the military. And um, these kids never had another job besides um, besides the military. So they were just professional soldiers from the time they were six, eight years old. Okay, And so um, one of the cool things about Sparta that's a little bit different is that women had way more freedom and power. So they were able to own land, they were able to own businesses, they were able to do all these things because oftentimes many of the men were away fighting in wars and doing things like that. Now, Sparta was not a democracy like Athens was. Sparta was an oligarchy. It was ruled by just a few military men, oftentimes headed by a king, the king of Sparta. Okay, uh, The people, the everyday people, played a much smaller part in the government of Sparta. Now, Athens and Sparta were always at each other's throat and having trouble, but then the Persian Wars came about, and an outside threat, the threat of Persia coming in and taking them all over, kind of united. They brought together, or brought back together Greece so that they could continue to have a free Greece. And what happened is the king of Persia named Darius, he decided that he was going to invade Greece. And so he brought his many, many ships and tons and tons of ships, and he had many soldiers, and it was one of the largest empires in the history of the world, the Persian Empire. And he brought them in um, to an area called Marathon. And so what ended up happening is the Greeks were completely surrounded by the Persians, and, and they were kind of stuck. And they knew that if these Persians could land their ships and get off their ships and start to fight, then they had no chance and they would be destroyed by this huge Persian army. And so what they decided to do under the direction of one of their military leaders named Themistocles is they decided to push them back into the sea before they could get prepared. And so there was this big battle, and the Athenian troops came in and just attacked as hard as they could. And eventually, the Persians realized, we're not going to be able to get off of our ships, and they had to retreat. Now, um, during this battle, Darius is said to have died um, and gotten shot by an arrow and killed. Okay, And so... What what ended up happening, the reason that we know the word marathon is because we know that it's a race, and this race is about 26, well, it's exactly 26.2 miles. And the reason we have a marathon um, that's 26.2 miles is because a messenger ran back with word of this victory back all the way to Athens from this um, area in Marathon. And he ran 26.2 miles, except for he, like, sprinted it as quick as he could. And then he delivered his message and immediately fell over dead. And so in order to honor that messenger, uh, people have, from there on, done these, uh, or done this, uh, these races that are called marathons. Um, the king of Darius, the new king of Persia, or I'm sorry, the son of Darius, the new king of Persia was named Xerxes, and Xerxes is this kind of strange looking name here, um, and he decided after a few years that he was going to attack again, and so he attacked again in the second Persian war, and one of the most famous battles in all of history is the Battle of Thermopylae. And the Battle of Thermopylae happened where um, King Leonidas, the king of the Spartans, wanted to get people to join him and fight against the Persians and stop them because they were marching across the land this time. But he had found a spot in Thermopylae where it wasn't very wide. And on one side was the ocean, on the other side was a cliff. And so you, the, these Persians would have to march through there. And their superior numbers, the amount of uh, troops that they had that some people say might have been like as much as uh, a million troops, is or would kind of be... You know, their, that advantage would be gone because they wouldn't have uh, as much space to be able to send that many at you. And so they could only send a few at a time. 
And so um, he was trying to get all the other Greeks to join him, and he was really unsuccessful, and he couldn't even get Sparta to agree um, because it was happening during a religious festival. And they were saying, we're not going to fight during this until it's all over. Well, he went outside of the government, and he said, who wants to come with me? And there were 300 Spartans that said that they would come with him. And so them, the 300 Spartans and about a 1,000 other free Greeks ended up fighting in the Battle of Thermopylae, and they held off attack after attack after attack after attack before um, a traitor who had been kind of cast out from Spartan society uh, showed the Persians a way to get around behind these uh, outnumbered Spartans, and then the Persians were able to get behind them and um, defeat and kill them. But the Spartans had held off the... Um, Persians long enough that um, a lot of the Athenians and things like that were able to escape and get away, and eventually the Persians kind of started to, or ended up losing the war because they weren't able to wipe out uh, the free Greeks. So eventually the city-states of Greece started to fight with each other, and they kind of started to decline um, after all of this. And so the next kind of big empire that would rise would be Rome. And what happened in Rome, which Rome is just a city, as a matter of fact, Rome is right here. Um, Rome is just a city that is in the middle of Italy. Now, what ended up happening is the Latins came in, the Latin people, and they started to settle in Rome in about the 700s BC. Um, now, they were there, most of them were there, but the Etruscans from northern Italy, from the northern part, were allowed to kind of rule over them. And so they said, that's fine, whatever, it's okay. Okay, And so they started to form a couple of important things. They started to form the Latin alphabet, which is the alphabet that we use today. They also started to uh, form and kind of take over this Greek formation that the Spartans used called the phalanx, which a phalanx is where um, you have a square of troops. And so uh, I'll draw one in here, but if you've got all of these people, square, 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 you know, it's, it's a few deep and wide. And so each troop would cover with their shield uh, in their left hand, they would cover half of themselves and half of the troop next to them, and then they were left free to fight with their right hand, and all they had to do was hold their shield up, and they would be protected half by their own shield and half by the next troop's over shield. Uh, they also paved the streets, which allowed the armies as well as the uh, merchants and things like that to move faster throughout Rome and uh, they built in stone arches which allowed them to support really heavy buildings and heavy construction and so um, in about 509 BC so that's you know 200 years after the Latins had come in uh, they overthrew the Etruscans and they established a brand new republic. They didn't want any more kings or emperors or anything like that. And so their republic included these bottom two things. They included uh, the Senate and the Citizens' Assembly. Okay, and those were kind of the legislative bodies. And then they also included patricians and plebeians. And those are just the people. And so uh, definitions of what a patrician and a plebeian is, a patrician are these rich aristocrats who have had power and been in power and their families have been in power for a very long time. That's a patrician. Whereas a plebeian is just everybody else, these people that didn't have very much money and were just common people and regular workers. So um, unless you were a family member of nobility, most people were plebeians. So this is the way the Roman Republic's government worked. There were about 300 patrician senators that were elected, and they, they became the senators that, that kind of created the laws, and they, for the first time, took those laws and wrote them down into something called the Twelve Tables. And so basically, if the laws are written down, it's really hard for people to ignore them um, when they're handed out. If you have a, take over a new colony, you hand them the laws, and you say, this is it, you have to follow these. Um, outside of the 300 patrician senators, there were more people than that. So the Senate is, and on this chart right here, we have our 300 patrician senators right here. Okay, And then 
to give the plebeians a little bit of power, they allowed them to have 10 plebeian tribunes. And so you can see the senators are a mix of patricians and plebeians, but um, the tribunes are all plebeians. And what they could do is they could overthrow or overturn anything that they thought was unfair to the plebeians, that they thought was unfair to the regular citizens. Okay, and so they could look at the senator's thing or at the senator's ideas and laws and things like that, and they could overturn them if they did not like them. And then on the very top of this was the two consuls, and oftentimes the two consuls there would be one plebeian and one patrician consul. And the consuls were kind of like the presidents. They were co-presidents. They worked together, and they led the government. If there was trouble, if there was some sort of uprising or something bad happened, then it was okay for one of these consuls to take over as a dictator. Okay, But it was written into basically their constitution saying that if someone took this power and took over as dictator to make kind of things run more efficiently and more smoothly – then they could only be the dictator for six months, and then they were not allowed to be anymore. They would have to reestablish the republic. Okay, And so this Roman Republic was, again, one of the first, very first in the world, representative democracies, Okay, where you would elect people, and they would uh, make laws for you, and then if you didn't like them, you wouldn't vote them in the next time. Okay, And so it influenced many, many governments throughout history, including the USA's. Our government is modeled after the Roman Republic. And so Rome, under the Republic, started to grow. Um, and so there were uh, they grew through two different methods, through making friends and alliances, and then also through conquest, where they would defeat other people and take them over. And they started to expand. Um, and every single group that they defeated, they would make them promise to provide troops. And so their army started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, as a matter of fact, Rome never even had a cavalry. They didn't have any Romans who were on horses. They used people that they had defeated to become the Calgary for, or sorry, cavalry um, for Rome. And so uh, they started to do this. One of the big sets of wars where they had to decide who was going to be the superpower, who was going to be the big power in North Africa and Southern Europe was the Punic Wars. And the Punic Wars were between Rome and Carthage. And Carthage was a North African empire. Okay, And so they fought. And they fought a few different wars. But in the last one, the leader or the military leader from North Africa, Hannibal, came across the Alps. He went around, came across these huge mountains with or, war elephants and all kinds of stuff. That was his big thing was to bring elephants. And Rome ended up finally winning that battle. And so Rome very quickly became a superpower. They were dominant in the Mediterranean Sea area. They were the dominant superpower. Um, Julius Caesar was one of the Roman... Uh, generals at the time and he conquered gaul he took over gaul which is this area of france and belgium and so he helped to do that and he fought many germanic people and did all that kind of stuff and then eventually he brought his army in and invaded italy and made himself the emperor he lasted a little while as the emperor of rome until uh, in order to save the republic um, some of as a matter of fact some of his good friends and uh his or the senators uh, murdered him. They assassinated him, and and his best friend ended up stabbing him in the back, named Brutus. And it's famous that he turned and he saw who had stabbed him, and it was Brutus. It was one of his best friends, and he said, "Et tu, Brute," like saying, "You too, Brutus. You really want to do this to me, also? Everybody else, I I understand, but not my best friend." Okay. And so they were trying to save the Republic, but what actually happened is it did the opposite. The Republic did not stick around. There was absolute chaos in the end of the Republic, and there were all kinds of people trying to grab for that power that Julius Caesar had made. And so um, emperors started to move through very quickly. The emperor that was able to settle things down about 23 years later after um, – Caesar's death was Caesar's nephew, and his name was Augustus. And um, he 
was the Roman Empire that eventually stabilized it and brought it back under control. And he led them in, led Rome into an area that was known, or uh, sorry, an era in time that was known as Pax Romana. And Pax Romana was a period of Roman peace. That's what it means is Roman peace. And that lasted about 200 years. Obviously, Augustus was not in charge for all of that because nobody lived for 200 years. Um, but why did the empire keep growing? What was their advantage that they had that nobody else had? And what they had was they started to set up colonies. And when they set up these colonies, Romans moved out there. And the people that lived in these colonies became citizens of Rome, and so they got all the benefits. So they very quickly became, these people in the colonies became Roman people. Um, the Roman law, also the written Roman law, started to spread, which unified these people. They all were um, agreeing to the same thing. Uh, they also had those wonderful paved roads that we talked about before that allowed the soldiers to move very fast to keep order. If they were in one side of the empire and something blew up in the other side of the empire and they had to go take care of it, um, they could move very quickly from one side to the other. And the last thing they did is they started to trade using coins. So the coins were this medium of exchange that allowed that easier or allowed them to trade things easier than if they were bartering. Because if you were a chicken farmer and you needed someone to paint your house, then you have to would have to find a painter that wanted a chicken. Okay. Uh, if not, if you have coins, then you could just find a painter. You could give them coins, and then you could sell your chicken for coins. So it was this medium of exchange that allowed you to uh, get whatever you wanted whenever you wanted. Um, also, this Greco-Roman culture, because Roman culture was kind of influenced by the Greeks, they admired the Greeks, uh, started to spread. And it spread through Gaul, which was that Spain, or sorry, France and Belgium area, through Spain, through North Africa. And this entire purple area started to take on the characteristics of Rome. Again, in Rome, about one-third of the people were slaves, um, and the slaves did a number of different things. They were farmers. Some of them were asked to go into the navy and be rowers on warships where they would be chained to the oars, and you would want to listen and row that uh, ship because otherwise if it went down, you were going down with it. You were going to sink with it. Um, many of them were house slaves, and so they worked in the kitchens and things like that, and they got very close to the people that were um, that owned them, and some of them were able to buy their freedom eventually. Uh, some of them worked in the mines for free. And then kind of the most famous ones probably were the gladiators, and the gladiators were slaves who were uh, captured and then trained to become kind of like soldiers, and they would be put into the arena, and they would go through death matches and these games were huge uh, some of these games would have uh, would include where they would fight animals wild animals like lions and bears and things like that that would stage historical battles and make sure that uh, the roman side won and each one you know half of the uh, gladiators would use german type weapons and the other half would use romans and they would fight against each other and it would be this big thing for people to see these fights to the death um and a lot of them were done, especially in Rome, in this building, which I think you have a picture of also, and this is called the Colosseum. The Colosseum was where the main gladiatorial games happened. And what, an interesting about, thing about the Colosseum is sometimes they would have navy battles in them. So they would fill it up with water, and then people would watch as these two ships went at each other and tried, or the people on these ships tried to kill each other. So it was kind of weird. Um, but... Some of these slaves could either buy or earn their freedom uh, in these fights as well. The religion was originally borrowed from the Greeks. It was that mythology type thing, and they had different names for their gods and things like that, but it was the same gods. Um, and sometimes the emperors were also sometimes seen as gods, or as partial gods at least. Then uh, Judea was conquered by the Romans, and Judea had a different faith. They had the Jewish faith. It's uh, one of the older faiths that we have around. Okay, And the Jewish faith is a monotheistic, one God faith. Okay, And the Romans said, 
you know what? We're going to be cool with it. We're going to let you stay where you're at. We're going to let you do your own religion. You can be Jewish. That's fine. However, the Jewish people still didn't like and resented someone else ruling them, and so they fought back. Well, when they fought back, the Romans eventually destroyed their temple in Jerusalem and killed thousands of Jewish people. And so the Jews ran away, obviously, to try and keep themselves alive, and they fled to all these other different parts of Europe. <clears throat> then in about 4 BC, the year 4 BC, Jesus uh, was born. And Jesus was a Jewish or the son of a Jewish a person, so he was a Jew, um, and he ended up growing up to become a carpenter in the city of Nazareth. Okay, and at 30 years old, he became a preacher. Okay, and his preaching was that he was the son of God. So he was born of a virgin mother, and he was actually the son of God. And his preaching said that there is only one God, okay? And his followers, the people that were closest to him, called him the Messiah, okay? And the reason they called him the Messiah is because it was believed by ancient tradition that there was a leader that would come that would be called the Messiah and would bring them freedom, okay? And so eventually many people started to call him Jesus Christ. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. And so if you've ever heard Jesus Christ as a uh, name given for Jesus, uh, that's because of this Greek word for Messiah is Christ. And so his teachings and what he taught and the things surrounding it uh, became Christianity and as we know today. Uh, Christianity started to spread, and it spread very, very quickly. But these Christians that were starting to join in got really bad treatment, especially in Rome, for about 200 years. years. I mean, this Emperor Nero would, would burn them alive and feed them to lions and things like that, unless, uh, you know, unless they were found to not be Christians. But then eventually, in 312 AD, so like 300 years later... The emperor of Rome became Constantine, and he was a Christian. And so eventually, within about 100 years, about 412 AD, most Romans had become Christian, and it started to spread all over Europe. Now, there's a lot of different ideas, but we don't know for sure why the Roman Empire fell. It was so big and so powerful. How did it fall apart? A lot of people think that people in Rome just started to go crazy, and they started to go crazy because there was lead in like daily objects like cone or combs and brushes and all kinds of different things like that uh, that people were having in contact with their skin had lead in them, and lead is something that can get affect your brain and, and essentially make you go crazy and eventually kill you. So um, that's one thought, but we don't really know. But here's some things that happened that kind of made the empire fall. First off, there were way too many power changes. In a 50-year period of time, at the end, there were 60 different emperors, more than one per year. Uh, the emperors were poisoning each other. They were killing people. It was uh, just a constant struggle for power during this time. And there were some really bad emperors in here. Um, some that were long, around for a long time and some that were around for a very short time. Now, the other thing that happened is the taxes increased. So a whole lot of the money or a whole lot more money was asked of the people to bring to the government. And uh, the population went up and the prices went up because disease was starting to kill people and they needed more money and more people to come in and replace that. And so... The Roman army at the same time was really being weakened. That's the third one. And what was happening is a lot of people didn't want to be soldiers anymore. And so they started to have to hire in order to keep this big empire under control. They had to hire soldiers and pay them. So they were mercenaries. But if you have a mercenary and you're paying them $100 uh, you know, a day or something, if somebody else is going to pay them $200 a day, they might turn around and kill you. Okay, So that is... Uh, one of the problems of having mercenaries. The last part that really kind of took them apart was the death blow was the emperor Diocletian. He divided the empire, okay? And so he divided the empire into two chunks, the eastern 
you're a Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire with two different emperors. And so he took over the Western Roman Empire, and eventually the Western part fell to Germanic invaders, and the Eastern part uh, would become a new empire that would stay successful for a while named the Byzantine Empire.